Um, I actually have an irrational dislike of farmers, and uh, some of that comes through in my thesis. <laughs> and I thought I would explore that a little bit more by using a kind of genre procedural. So this is a police encounter between a farmer um, and then a sheriff's deputy. Um, I'll let me try to get my breathing rhythm back. Men who pronounce, now as I see it, as the washborn, now as I said, the one behind his deputy star and the other framed in the cave light of his home, silts on their tongues, a boy, late teens, some twenty yards away, in pieces, beside a crepuscular New Holland combine harvester, as dead as the step-down handler of some shit-stung elephant, the big machine, the eviscerated boy, the two men chewing around his fate, nimmed by the gasping rays of evening's descent. The deputy has been rounding on the farmer for some time. The boy, an itinerant, had developed a reputation. Faggot or no faggot, you let him bleed out in a cornfield 70 feet from the front door of your farmhouse, his arm ripped off. The thresher done it, that's obvious. There's a sleeve of flesh like taffy wrapped around its piston, and a red splash like he'd on a cannonball. But he didn't. Corn stalks don't sop up blood, and they don't hide no tire tracks, and you mean to feed me the fucking hog slops of a fairy tale about high neither you, nor Rachel, or Cannon, or home at the dinner hour to see your priestly little farmhand lose his shirt, his shit, his scalp, his mouth. I've been out in the field, Dale. The deputy flings a quivering finger in the general direction. Dale, this is like some boy exploded in your driveway. <laughs> My daughter could punt a football as far as that body is from tonight. And that's saying nothing, Dale, because you know how old Natalie is? <laughs> deputy steps back, snapping the buttons in his utility belt, repeats, Do you know how old Natalie is? Deputy sucks on his mustache, concerned. That's a question you can't answer, Dale, because your daughter and my daughter, they're learning their primes together. They share a teacher. We see each other at PTOs. You dumb son of a bitch, how old is my daughter? <laughs> Through an embarrassed cough, Dale says, Probably six. Six or seven. <laughs> That's right. My little six-year-old princess can punt a fucking football as far as that dear boy is lying out there face up to the crows with his teeth missing. You know where his teeth are? You know where they are, you goddamn lump? Dale objects. I didn't take them. And gets the toe is good on the doorframe. Ain't pushing and rutting. Ain't no hog. Now, now. Don't get ahead of yourself. I know you didn't take them. You're too squamish, Dale. You've got to have a stomach for guts. No, those teeth are in the saw. Got packed into the ground. Beat out his skull after the thresher took him. Had him dancing somersaults. Bye-bye, teeth. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Rachel emerges from the house. Face hovers over her husband's left shoulder. She pats his shirt front from behind. Why, this is the strangest interrogation I have ever known. <laughs> you done rambling at Dale here half an hour longer. He gonna tell you no different. We took Cannon from basketball practice straight to dinner in town. I have a receipt right here. It's got the time on it. Dine in here at the top. Cheeseburgers, two order slaw, three order chuck fries, a peanut butter malt shake here at the bottom. Right here at the bottom. It was real fine. Real cold going down. We ate with the Maddox and the Friars. You know, Stacy just had her baby. That's her second. <laughs> She's a junior in the Oxford Township High School where they got daycare. I wanted Cannon to sit beside her and get real uncomfortable thinking about banging anyone until he's played through his scholarship in college. College, Charles. It's a place with fancy big buildings and long, long sidewalks and open green spaces, a few classrooms, plenty of whores. <laughs> I've been to college, Rachel. <laughs> nope, Charles, you've been on visits. Where'd Robbie decide? It's a sore point. You deferred, he's taking a year out. Deputy takes a step back. Wants to see the country. Oh, Charles, that's right. Rachel rakes Dale back inside and itches her fist on the screen door's mesh. Alyssa Fryer, she told me all about that at dinner. How your boy found God. How he took to that retreat center, that's tough on a father. Loving Christ in the mountain wilderness, singing hymns out of doors, just camping with the loving Lord. Well, that is a shame. <laughs> but divorce changes people. You know, changes sons too. Thank you, Rachel. Her yellow hair in the night looks blue and orange. A moth attracted the garage door security lamp flutters between the two, and they breathe sadly together, staring at the moth. And Rachel extends her hand out as if to touch its big dusty wings, 
but the moth, but the moth had sucked way into the night, and the deputy's face follows the miracle passes. Coroner will be here in 20, and deputy's here with a forensic kit and same. I just need to know. You been out there checking his pockets, Charles? No, Rachel, I secured a parameter. You didn't rifle through his little wallet? I know who he is. I didn't mean for the idea. I know what you fucking meant. You're better than I, Rachel. Look, it's not my family's concern. Rachel, you are insane if you think this has nothing to do with you. It's not my boy. We catch her at the land. That's Sweeney's till. If you think Dale got a drag on the field, you seriously underestimate the amount of hard alcohol we go through in these parks. I did not see Dale on a tractor if he made twice on the plow. You see Dale on a tractor, you run the other direction. He will kill himself. He will kill my son. He will kill you if he gets near any implement bigger than our toaster. And I'm about to hide that. <laughs> that Sweeney's boy. Sweeney rents the land from us, and we've been renting the land from the banks in 07 on account it's all a lean against the Detweilers. Deputy shakes his head. Times are tough. Whew, don't you know it. But I'm saying is, that Sweeney's idiot bled out there in the field. He hired him, he managed him, and somehow he let him fucking die. Now, you want to come back? Bring us that warrant. And officer? Yes, Rachel. You have a very good night. Thank you. All right. <laughs>
From the battered house at the end of the road paling in the rain, from the roar of falling light, from the last breath, there is no escape. From joy, no escape. And in the spirit of ending, this poem is doxology. In the story of Buddha's death, his intendant Ananda kneels, weeping at his side, face fallen from grief, golden robe darkening with tears. Ananda is an anxious man, so Buddha strives to call him, calm him. Past Buddhas have had good attendance, but none like you, Ananda. Buddha lifts his face to the west, gazing on far rice fields flickering and flaring in the falling light that now and forever, world without end, lights the earth. Buddha speaks, Ananda, have you seen the golden rice field stretching out to the horizon? They are so beautiful. Ananda pauses, looks westward. Yes, Lord, they are beautiful. Shot through with late sun, the still air glitters. Buddha's eyes close, his arms and legs stiffen. The sun sinks, Ananda's heart breaks, but the rice fields remain. The night wind rises, runs blue fingers through their hair as now and forever, world without end, I am traveling home this evening, caught at a lonely crossing by a passing train. I pause, look westward, to watch twilight's first red rays set fire to fields of wild grass around me. The night wind rises, runs blue fingers through my hair. Rushes whisper in the distance, many-tongued. Tattered birches green, gleam whitely, their leaves like flames flickering and flaring in the falling light that now and forever, world without end, lights my eyes. And once again I know there is no other world. Here are all the fallen stars of heaven. Here are all the fires of hell. Here are bodies burning in time and blazing with sun. Here is the heart born through millions of skies and its chariot of bones. The train roars past, disappearing, in, disappearing into the openness of an opal sky which remains stretching out to the horizon and beyond, curving its limpid arms now and forever over this world without end. Thank you. And I'm so happy to introduce our next reader, Megan Elise. Mm, Megan. No. Drew. Oh, sorry, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong, the wrong <laughs> Drew. Drew Callback <laughs> is from Philadelphia. He is the author of Some Things on the Internet. Welcome, Drew. <laughs>